In June 1944, these sleepy country lanes were awakened by the deafening noise of men and machinery as the Allies prepared for their invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. Not only hundreds of thousands of men, but also tens of thousands of vehicles would need to be shipped across the channel to Normandy. And we're here today in Dorset, where roughly 70 to 80 genuine World War II vehicles have come to form what could be the last convoy of its kind to commemorate events in this village 78 years ago before D-Day. The History Hit YouTube team was along for the ride in the armour and embarkation convoy and we had set ourselves one simple goal. Our challenge today is to find some of the biggest, some of the rarest and some of the most impressive vehicles of the Second World War. This is Monster Vehicles of World War II. As D-Day approached in June 1944, Allied military planners needed to be sure that they had the vehicles to meet every conceivable challenge on the continent. Reconnaissance, recovery, transport and combat vehicles would all need to amass on the south coast of England in their thousands. As we showed up at base camp in the village of Broadmain, one of the original marshalling areas used before Operation Overlord, the convoy was minutes away from leaving. We had to find a ride, and quickly. Luckily, John Comber, who owned a Diamond T Wrecker at the back of the queue, let us hop on board. And before we knew it, we had set off, rolling through the peaceful lanes of Dorset. So we're travelling down these absolutely beautiful country lanes in Dorset at the moment and these haven't changed since the summer of 1944 really. This is exactly the scene that would have greeted uh, soldiers heading down towards the south coast ready for the D-Day landings. How many, car how many vehicles do you think we've got behind us? I mean there's roughly 70 to 80 vehicles here and the scale of this is already incredible so you just imagine what, 50,000 vehicles yeah. were deployed for D-Day. You've got jeeps, you've got tanks, trucks, everything's here. And this sight that you see behind me, this is what soldiers would have seen back in 1944. It's just incredible. And we always think about the men, the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who would have headed across to the Normandy beaches. But you've got to think about the planning, the number of vehicles that would have been required, the thousands, millions of tonnes of supplies that would have been needed as well. And it's it's quite a contrast seeing these, these lovely kind of green fields around us, just absolutely full of machinery at the moment. It's quite a hard thing to put into words when you're sat on top of this truck and you see the convoy of vehicles behind you. You can imagine as a soldier, before D-Day, the scale of the operation, you would have felt almost, not invincible, but you would have felt very, very confident, certainly, seeing how many people were involved. This was a, a, a multi-nation effort. And yeah, you feel very powerful. The convoy would be travelling from the original D-5 camp in Broadmain, 12 miles to Bovington Tank Museum. Next, the convoy would head to a nearby military training area where these original vehicles would be put through their paces. Then it was on to Dorchester, where members of the public would get to see the vehicles up close before we returned to base camp in the evening. But before we reached our first checkpoint, we had an obstacle to overcome. We're about to go across quite a deep looking ford. Fortunately, these vehicles are built for all terrain, so it should be okay. Could be quite bumpy though. I think it'll handle it. Uh, we've got a little uh, vehicle that, I don't know if it's stuck or, maybe it's just chilling out. We'd offer to lend a hand, but can't really just keep rolling. <laughs> Our first pit stop in Morton Forest allowed us to get a proper bird's eye view of the convoy, an appreciation of the scale of the operation and an opportunity to scout out some monster vehicles.
But with only time to make a few inquiries, we were already on the road again. So the vehicle earlier that got stuck in the water has managed to get out. Good news, it's definitely suited to this kind of terrain. That must have, must have been quite a challenge to get out of that. Luke clearly wasn't as suited to the terrain as the vehicles, but luckily for him, we were soon at the Tank Museum in Bovington. Here we could get a better view of some of the incredibly rare vehicles on display, but we also needed to find ourselves another lift. So we just took a uh, quick pit stop at Bovington Tank Museum, and we've uh, since which rides, haven't we, Luke? We have. We are now in an M3A1 half track. These guys have very kindly given us a lift and we're heading to a military training facility where we're going to put some of these World War II vehicles to the test. This half track actually appeared in the film Fury, so it's got, it's got some Hollywood credentials. Looking forward to it. As we approached the training ground, I was able to find out more about what a half track actually did. Can you tell us a little bit more about the half track itself? Like, how, how was this vehicle used in the Second World War? This vehicle would basically would have been used very much to basically not only transport tr uh, troops forward, but basically get them to like, the forward edge of the battle area. So, this being an M3A1, I call it the gunship. Okay. Um, because it could have it's got the 50 on the front, two 30s on the side. It could also have another machine gun on the rear. Right. Okay. And the idea would be to basically get the troops as close as possible to the forward edge of the battle area. Basically, they would debus and then complete the final bounds while at the same time getting uh, mutual fire support from this vehicle. So you could say this is like an earlier, earlier version of an IFV, infantry fighting vehicle. Got it. And it was time for our new half-track to be put to the ultimate test on the military training ground. To put it simply, we had no idea what was about to hit us. Uh, we good, thank you. Ooh. So we're just going through the uh, training area in this half track, and I'll tell you what, it's very dusty, it's just a whole cloud of dust. This thing can go 40 miles per hour. And as you can probably tell, there's dust everywhere. Woo! It's kind of hard to keep our eyes open at the moment, uh, going through the dust here. I think I'd rather be in a tank right now. Feeling like we'd entered the North African desert rather than a field in Dorset, we were about to enter a drag race with two other half tracks. We're about to see what the half track can do. We're gonna open up the throttle. This thing can travel about 40 miles an hour. No bumps on this road, fortunately, but it can go pretty fast. Literally dusting ourselves down after that half track race, we had another opportunity to do some more scouting. After a quick glimpse at some of the monster vehicles we intended to check out later, the convoy was already preparing to set off again. This time, we were heading to the town of Dorchester, where we were told to expect something of a hero's welcome. Thank you. 
Luke obviously thinks that he's a con conquering US general entering Dorchester here, waving to people. They all got their phones. No more waving, it's all phones now. <laughs> With the vehicles lined up along the main high street, it was time to get up close and personal with our monster vehicle candidates. It did seem, however, that we'd have to compete with what seemed like the entire population of the town. But it didn't take long before my eyes were drawn to a vehicle we'd met earlier in the day. Uh, so we're here, all the uh, vehicles from the convoy have all parked up in Dorchester. Very lively atmosphere. Uh, now I'm here with Richard. Now, when I saw this vehicle, I had to stop by. Can you tell me, First of all, what it's called and what it would have been used for in the Second World War. OK, so it's part of the Royal Artillery and every regiment had a detachment of five or six of these six-pounders okay. and a Lloyd. So this is a six-pound anti-tank gun yep. Okay, and it was pulled by this vehicle here, which is called a Lloyd carrier um, towing. Okay. Yep. Were a lot of these made? Because I, I haven't really seen any of, of these vehicles in the sort of archive in the footage. Okay, yep, there was 26,000 made. Okay. And there's 22 left in the world. Wow. All right. Um, so very rare now. In fact, both the gun, the six pounder gun and the anti tank, the anti -tank tractor are both quite rare. Very lightly armoured. Yeah, uh, okay. They weren't designed to be in front. They were just, just uh, designed to drop this down. The crew would open up. They'd either it dug in or they would, it's, it's a quick firing. So it, when it recoils, it ejects its own shell and the other person can put the shell straight in. Right, okay. okay. It's a very quick, uh, very fast quick action. drop it, take the tank out, hitch up, yep. get out. Now, speaking of lightly armoured, how fast can this thing travel? 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour, yeah. okay. It's powered by a V8 uh, okay. flathead, yes. um, Canadian, about 85 horsepower, which, to be honest, is still underpowered. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me a bit about this engine if we just come over here? Yeah. Can you tell me about, a bit about this thing right here? This is the, the typical flathead very well used in all sorts of applications yeah. um, and you, to be honest you can still get parts for those today I mean they were still used by Ford right, um, okay. and um, the British made them as well. Now do you know any uh, significant battles or operations that these sort of vehicles would have been used in during the Second World War? Oh gosh most of them yeah, um, okay. with the British involved yeah Hill 112 okay with, yeah um, they would have been used in part of the armoured group for going towards Arnhem. Okay. They would have been, you know, they would have all over. Mainly in Europe, also in Africa perhaps as well? Africa, yep. Yeah. Yeah, they were used in Africa. In fact, the six pounder was first released in Africa against the uh, Germans. Um, and then they follow right the way through to Italy. Italy, okay. And how many people could fit in this, in this, this vehicle? This particular one is a two man but it would have another vehicle, okay, a yeah. spare one, no, no, no gun, yeah. which would have another four crew in it, and it would have all extra ammunition for backup. Right, okay. okay. So very much a utility sort of yes. reinforcements. They used them in several applications. They don't, um, I mean, like I said, this is an anti-tank tractor. Yeah. They used them for cable laying for the Royal Signals. They used them for armoured personal carriers and they used them for startups. So right. starting up tanks. So they had a big pack of batteries and they had a dynamo, basically jump starting the, uh, tanks or the, the planes. It's you know, so a very, this. very important vehicle. Do you reckon mm -hmm. we'd be able to go inside and have a you look? You can have a look, yep. Okay. So the first thing I noticed, this is a, is this a Sten gun? No, it's a Bren, oh, Bren, Bren, Bren gun, gun Mark it. One. It would have, it's part of its tools. Um, the crew would have had a Bren gun for protection, Mark One. They'd also, I haven't got it on there, I've got one, but they would have had a two inch mortar. There's no, the only armor on this is Yeah, I was gonna ask about the front, armor. Right. Front and side up to there. All the rest of it is tin and the floor's tin. So it's not going to, uh, it's not going to stop a... Uh, no, if you went over a... No, no, no. If you went over a mine or anything, yeah. you would just be blown to smithereens. Wow, OK. OK. So s slightly uh, vulnerable in certain areas, but still a very, very valuable yeah. vehicle. That was used widely throughout the Second World War. That's right. And just to give them added, added protection, you had 25-gallon petrol tanks either side. <laughs> <laughs> so I want those catching fire. <laughs> um, 
Not a bad start with the Lloyd Carrier, but this was a competition where size mattered, and I'd found a pretty big truck pulling a pretty big gun. So this one is a very interesting uh, piece of equipment. This is a long tom. Uh, this is one of the largest allied artillery pieces that could be towed by a vehicle in one piece. I mean, as you can see, it's pretty massive, 155 millimeter shells this would have fired, and it's towed by this gigantic truck. This is the Mac NO, manufactured by Mac Vehicles in America. And Steve, the owner, has allowed us to get in and have a look. All right, let's try and get in. You can tell by just how high this is, this is really a monstrous World War II vehicle. So, built by Mack Motors in the USA. This one, this specific vehicle was built in 1944, ready for action in Europe. After the Second World War, it was purchased by the British Army, and then apparently it was a breakdown truck for many years before being purchased by Steve at auction. But as you can see, this is a pretty huge vehicle, very American if I can say that. And if you look up here, there's not too many vehicles in this convoy that are, that are taller than this one. Yeah. Much to the amusement of our cameraman Ollie, getting into the truck wasn't as easy as it looked. <laughs> So as we said, this truck specifically designed to carry this artillery piece, and a massive artillery piece it is. This truck, 11.6 litre petrol engine, apparently only about 6,000 were built because they weren't quite as popular as the diesel engine trucks, but it's certainly a monster vehicle of World War II. I wonder what Luke's got to compete with this. Well, I've seen uh, two medium to small sized vehicles already, uh, but this right here, this vehicle took my eye straight away. This really is a monster vehicle of World War II and I'm here with Max. Max, thank you for showing sure. us this vehicle. Can you tell me a bit about, first of all, what it's called and when this would have been used, what for? Uh, it's a M26 Pacific Dragon Wagon. The nickname is Dragon Wagon. Um, it was used for armoured tank recovery. Um, it also, the recovery gear folds down and carries a trailer, so you can recover the tank and okay. then you put the trailer back on and put the tank onto the trailer. Um, it's an armoured cab, so it could recover under fire. Um, so it has quite a lot of armour, right? It's yeah, it's not, armored. it's not thick armour, no. it's just for rifle bullets and okay. snipers and stuff, not, not for tank rounds. You know, it's yeah. just a thinly armoured cab. And how heavy do you reckon this is? Uh, it's 21 you know? tonne, the, the truck's 21 tonne. Wow. Uh, I think the trailer's a 20 tonne and then you can normally put a 45 tonne tank on, but we have photos of 65 tonne German tanks on and no wow. problem at all. So. That's incredible. So what, what theatres of, of war would this be of you? Uh, mainly, used in, what operations? they were used in Europe. You know, they, they went in, in D-Day, they were used right through, okay. right through to the end of the war. Used for tank recovery and then when the Rhine crossing came, they were used for moving landing craft up Got to it. the Rhine crossing and used right after the war for clearing up all the battlefields, yeah. used right into the Korean War, wow. um, and then they went onto a different truck. And this is very, it's very rare. I haven't really seen this on any no, footage. How, how rare is this vehicle, if you can uh, put it into context? Well, there was 750 built, I think. Okay, um, so not that many, realistically, no, at all. No, um, not when there was 66,000 Shermans built. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's only two armoured cab restored ones in the UK. Only so, two of these yeah, left? Yeah. And one you've got one of them. And one of yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And would you be able to show me inside? Yeah, yeah, no it's problem. Cool. Right, first thing I'd say is the amount of space in it. It's quite spacious compared to some of the other vehicles we've been in so far. Yeah, it's a seven man crew. Okay. There's seven men to deal with all the recovery equipment. Yep. <coughs> a lot of the stuff's very heavy, so that's why they had a seven man crew. So, yeah, you have a lot of space. Engines in the middle. Engines in the middle, okay. What kind of engine? It's a Hall Scott 400, 440, 240 horsepower, wow. 18 litre straight six petrol. Can't imagine uh, it's cheap to fill this thing up. <laughs> yeah, it does about one mile to the gallon. So. Got it. Wow. Yeah. It's like the ultimate monster utility vehicle of yeah. World War II, yeah. basically. It's the largest petrol engine truck ever built. Wow. Yeah. So, so what's, what's uh, up here? That's anti aircraft. Okay. Uh, 
0.5 Browning 50 cal known as, um, but that is on, on a ring mount and they put it on most, a lot of vehicles, same as this one here, it's just for anti-aircraft. And uh, what was the process of restoration like? Horrendous. Horrendous. <laughs> but you've got one of one of the only two surviving dragon riders yeah, in, in the UK. In that UK. must feel pretty special. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Right on top of this beast that is uh, the dragon wagon with a 50 cal machine gun. It's got everything. It's got armor. It's got an anti-aircraft gun, it's got space. I tell you what, Louis's got his work cut out because I think this is the winner of the monster vehicle of World War II challenge. An admittedly remarkable vehicle, but I reckoned I'd found the Dragon Wagon some stiff competition. So I'm here with Jim and Jim's gonna show us the high-speed tractor. Now this is an unusual looking vehicle. What can you tell us about it? What was it used for? Uh, it's a M4 high-speed tractor built in 1944 okay. by Alice Chalmers. It's built to take a crew of 11 um, crew, to tow the gun, which is behind it. Um, there's only about four or five in the country. Um, the gun is totally unique. There's only one in the country. Uh, it's still alive. Um, and as far as I know, it's only one in private hands in Europe. Right. The gun uh, which is towing is a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. Um, these tractors were designed to pull these, uh, pull that gun and the long tom, which is at the back of the right, queue. Right, okay, huge artillery piece yeah, up there, the, yeah. So the, the ammunition box would be a different shape to take the bigger shells, but this box is correct for the gun. Um, and they were used from, um, uh, from Normandy, from D-Day, all the way through, and then during the Ardennes Battle of the, of the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge, these guns were used for anti-tank right, support. Okay. I know yeah. it says that the Luftwaffe's nightmare on the front, yeah. so there's the anti-aircraft element there, right? That's right, yeah. I, I found a picture of um, one of these, um, which the, the picture was dated 19, uh, the 4th of June 1944, and I, I copied it exactly. And what makes this a, a, a tractor? Is it is it the, is it these basically? Yeah, uh, I mean it, it's called an M4 high speed tractor. That, yeah. That's it, that's its uh, name. Um, it'll do about 35 miles an hour, um, but it obviously it's on tracks because of trying to pull something in muddy ground. You need a track vehicle rather than you know like a big wheeled vehicle. Got it. Can we yeah. take a look inside? Yeah, this yeah, part? of course you can. Yeah, it's not easy to get into. None, um, of, them, none of them seem to be today. Right. <laughs> No problems getting in this time, at least I'd had some practice. All right, so Jim, we're in the cab here. Yep. Uh, talk us through what we've got here. Is this, a, is this a hard vehicle to drive? No, it's fairly simple. You've obviously got two sticks to steer the vehicle. If you want to turn right, you pull the right stick back. If you want to go left, you pull the left stick back. And if you want to stop, you pull them both back. Got it, sounds fairly simple. It's very, very easy to operate. Uh, you've got this switch there, which is the ignition switch. Nice. Powerful sounding engine. So that's, that's in low now. Then you let your foot off the clutch. It's got a torque converter. So when I rev the engine, if I revved it now, it would start to move forward. Right, okay. And then once you've got up to about seven, eight miles an hour, you put your foot back on the clutch, pop it into high, which is down there, and then you've got a second gear. So presumably this vehicle is going to have to be extremely powerful. It's going to, if it's pulling one of those long tom artillery pieces. Yeah, it's, um, it's got a Walker Shaw engine. It's uh, about 210 horsepower. Okay, so top, it's top speed, I'm, I'm guessing it's not, not the fastest. About 35. No, that's, not, that's not too bad yeah. for... Um, you'd struggle to get that with the gun on the back, I think. Yeah. I've done about 30 in it with the gun on the back. Another impressive armoured vehicle restored to roadworthiness. But our time was up, and our candidates for best monster vehicle locked in. Time to hitch one more ride on our way back to base camp. So we've very generously been given another lift in another half-track. This time it's a British half-track. 
tell that because we've got a Sten gun down here, a Bren gun on the side, and we've got a mortar up front. And we are heading back to Broadmain campsite right now. But the question is, me or Luke, who has won? Who has found the best monster vehicle of World War II? After a long day on the road, we had returned to Broadmain, where 3,000 American troops had been stationed for six months before D-Day, to once again marvel at the range of World War II vehicles that had been assembled. We couldn't leave the village without a stop at the local pub for our challenge debrief. So we've had an absolutely epic day with the World War II convoy. 55 vehicles apparently, 20 motorcycles, uh, one of the largest gatherings of World War II vehicles probably in this country in the last, in the last decade. But the important question really is, what was the biggest monster vehicle that we saw today? I think there's, well, out of the contenders, I mean, for me, there's one that sticks in my mind. But if I go through the two that I saw, I saw um, two sort of similar vehicles in terms of what they did. They were utility vehicles. One was the Lloyd uh, carrier, and that was so unique. I've never seen anything like it. I think he said there were perhaps 75 uh, left in the UK. Could carry um, anti tank guns, it had an incredible engine, it was just so unique looking, uh, very British in design. But then the second uh, vehicle I saw, uh, the Dragon Wagon, I mean, that for me has got to be the number one contender. It was absolutely massive. It was Look, certainly bigger than the Lloyd Carrier. The, it was the biggest, not only from the outside, but also inside, so much space, it could. It could rescue tanks, it had its own anti-aircraft guns, um, and yeah, it, it was just, it was an absolute spectacle. It so was, that it was an impressive one. vehicle, it was an impressive vehicle. And I had the Mac NO pulling the yeah. Long Tom. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a impre pretty impressive truck, to be honest. I mean, the Long Tom, the largest artillery piece that could be towed in one go. But not great armour, it wasn't exactly something that was uh, going to be going into the front lines and defending itself. Mm -hmm. And then there was the high-speed track which I really, really liked. So this is a, it's another vehicle that carried its own, uh, kind of carried an artillery piece behind it, would drag it along, but it had its armor, it had a machine gun on top. It was, it was, it was a, a, a useful and, and, and versatile vehicle. However, I think I might have to hand it to the M26 Dragon Wagon. What I was gonna say, I think the Dragon Wagon was similar to the second vehicle you saw, but just slightly better in every single department. Um, but I think one thing we can say is all the vehicles we saw today were not ones you tend to see on the archive yeah, all in the very footage. rare vehicles. Very rare vehicles. I think the Dragon Wagon was one of only two left in the UK. So yeah. these are all incredibly rare vehicles. Um, but listen, if you're going to hand it to the Dragon Wagon, I won't complain. I think on this occasion we're going to give it to Luke and say the Dragon Wagon won. Not that Luke had anything is that, to is do with it. Is that a win for me? Is that a win for me? I'll mean, count it. It was, it was well found, a good spot from you, and uh, yes, you can take this challenge, well done. Brilliant. Cheers, Luke. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> this is Monster Vehicles of World War II. <laughs> <laughs> I am on a 12,000 tonne light cruiser in central London. It is the last of its kind to survive the Second World War. It was involved in D-Day, it was involved in the Korean War, it was involved in the sinking of the Scharnhorst. This is HMS Belfast. I'm James Rogers, a war historian and host of the History Hit Warfare podcast. And in this video, exclusively for the History Hit YouTube channel, I'm going to be diving into the story of one of the world's best known warships. We're going to find out what made HMS Belfast one of the most impressive cruisers of the 20th century, and why so many people still feel a connection to this vessel today.
In the early 1930s, the British Admiralty conceived of a new series of advanced warships to rival those in the Japanese Imperial Navy. They would need to be powerful and well armoured, but also manoeuvrable. Construction soon began on what were known as town-class light cruisers. Built in 1936 in Belfast by Harland and Wolfe, it was launched in 1938 by Anne Chamberlain, the then wife of Prime Minister Sir Neville Chamberlain. The date of that launch, well, it was St Patrick's Day, the 17th of March 1938. And when you put all of that together, you can see the reason why HMS Belfast is said to have the luck of the Irish. Belfast's luck would be tested when just four weeks after its launch, the Second World War broke out. It wasn't the most auspicious start. In November 1939, she was almost sunk off the coast of Scotland by an air-dropped magnetic mine. 46 personnel were injured. The ship was out of action for now. Wow, look at the size of these. For the first three years of the war, HMS Belfast was rendered useless by a magnetic mine. But come 1942, it was put back into service and it was sent for an important role. It was guarding the Arctic convoys as they moved those vital supplies from the United States over to the Soviet Union. But that meant that crew had to operate in some of the most austere, severe conditions. Let me give you an example. If you were out here on deck and it was raining, it was snowing, then you had to pickaxe through all of that ice. If this top deck got too ice heavy, then the ship had the risk of toppling over. But there was another risk. If you touch the side of this ship, if you touch this metal in those conditions, your hand would fuse to the metal. And that would mean a call to the ship's surgeon. It was while guarding one of these Arctic convoys that Belfast would face its first real challenge. Just off the Norwegian North Cape in December 1943, Belfast and her squadron spotted the Goliath German battleship Scharnhorst. In the ensuing confrontation, Scharnhorst was badly damaged by HMS Norfolk, but she managed to slip away. In 1943, Captain Parham and Admiral Burnett were sat on the bridge of the Belfast. They had a decision to make. They were chasing down the Shan horse, but it had gone off the radar. Now, naval doctrine said that they should head north and chase it down. But Burnett took a different view. He decided to stay with the convoy, predicting that Shan horse would return to attack from a new direction. Now, that move would prove decisive. Scharnhorst was soon spotted again and was engaged by Belfast and her squadron. The Germans tried to make a run for Nazi-occupied Norway with Belfast as the sole pursuer for several hours. But the arrival of HMS Duke of York and other elements of the British home fleet ensured she was trapped. This is the torpedo flat of HMS Belfast. It was fitted during the Second World War and it could fire up to six of these beasts. But it was only ever used once in anger. And that was against the Shan horse. The aim was to have that final blow to sink the ship. But that moment in history was taken away from the Belfast by HMS Duke of York. After distinguishing herself at the Battle of North Cape, the Belfast would go on to make another vital contribution to victory in World War II. In June 1944, she was the flagship of Bombardment Force E, supporting troops landing at Gold and Juno beaches in Normandy. These are HMS Belfast's gigantic six six-inch guns. They were some of the first to open fire on D-Day. In fact, they were vital to providing that support for landing troops. If you calculate it, they can shoot around 14, 15, maybe up to 20 miles. And that from here is as far as over the M25 and into Hertfordshire. 
if you're sitting at Scratchwood Services, for example, don't look up because that's exactly where they're honed in on. Now there are 12 guns in total on this ship and each individual gun can fire eight rounds a minute. And if we do some quick maths and put the whole battery together, then it's around 96 rounds a minute for all of those 12 guns. Put that into perspective, during the entirety of the Normandy campaign that the Belfast was involved in, it fired over 5,000 rounds. And a full broadside from the Belfast wasn't just a terrifying experience for the enemy, it could make life pretty uncomfortable on board. When the guns were fired in anger on this ship, men were thrown from their beds from the force alone. Cups were thrown across the room, whole dinners were thrown on the floor. And there's one particular story on D-Day that says the power of the guns shattered the toilets. The Normandy campaign would be the last time Belfast fired her guns in the Second World War. She headed to the Far East, just in time to see the Japanese surrender in 1945. But it's easy to forget that this ship wasn't simply a weapon. It was home to hundreds of sailors, often for months at a time. If you were one of them, space and privacy were non-existent. So imagine it, you finish your shift, it's been a hard slog, you want some rest. You've got to come to a room like this, and then you've got to put up your hammock. You reach in, you take a beast like this, and then you've got to strap it up to one of these metal bars around seven foot in the air. You've got to do it all by naval regulation, of course, and then once it's finally strapped up, just like these are here, you've got to try and get in. How do you do that? Well, you grab on and you hoist yourself up, all without trying to wake the guy who's sleeping next to you. This is your standard mess deck. As well as sleeping in here, you would eat in here, you would drink in here, you'd share your rum rations in here. And overall, there'd be about 20 people. This would have been a hub of activity during service. When you desperately needed some time to yourself, there was really only one place you could go. Now, we're going to take a look inside one of the places that you don't get to look as a member of the public. It's usually locked, but we've got a bit of special access. And this is the chapel. If you come inside, you can really see just how tiny this is. Think of the hundreds of crew on board this ship, and this is the one place you can get just that little bit of quiet that little bit of solitude. You're not going to get it on your mess deck, you're not going to get it anywhere else. If something's happened, if you've got a Dear John letter, I mean, this is the place you come, you make your peace with God or whatever your religion is, and you sit and you gather your thoughts. It wasn't too long before Belfast was called into action again. Already on patrol in the Pacific, she was on the spot when the Korean War broke out in 1950. Supporting the United Nations forces, she would carry out critical coastal bombardment for the next two years. I am here 48 steps down from the main deck in the belly of the beast of HMS Belfast. It's here that all the action happened. These are the shells it would have fired. So you think about of its role during the Korean War, well it would have been shells like this that it sent inland over those 14, 15 miles to try and hit the advancing North Korean army. It was these that were pivotal to halting their advance during the Korean War. This is the sick bay of the Belfast. You would have had hundreds of men treated in here through the Second World War and the Korean War. Everything from SDIs through to bullet wounds.
I've been granted access to come behind a restricted area of the ship. And the reason why is because a, a morbid bit of history happened down here. It was, it was around this area that in 1952, during the Korean War, a steward called Lao So was in his bunk sleeping when a shell crashed into the side of the ship. It ruptured a steam pipe and he died as a result of those injuries. But the remarkable thing about that story is that he is the only person to have ever been killed in anger on this ship. In the mid-1950s, Belfast underwent a major refit. The world was changing and she had to keep up with the developing Cold War naval doctrine. Between 1959 and 1962, she was back on patrol in the Pacific, but this would be her final mission. HMS Belfast had a long career in the Royal Navy. It spanned 25 years from the 1930s to the 1960s, and a lot changed over that time. A lot changed in geopolitics, but a lot also changed in technology. If you look all around me, you've got these Cold War radars. All of this was about trying to hunt down communist submarines and to try and protect the West. These are legacies of that stalemate of global politics left here today. The ship was decommissioned in the 1960s and by the 1970s it was due to be scrapped. The government was keen on this because they would have got five million pounds in today's money. But what they didn't bargain with was that by that time one of the ship's former captains, Morgan Morgan Giles, was now an MP and he used his political power, his persuasion, to stave the ship from execution, get it placed here in the centre of London amongst some of its greatest landmarks preserved for the nation. It's the largest surviving Royal Navy surface combatant of World War II, a priceless piece of Britain's heritage. And for those veterans who served on HMS Belfast, there's a special way to stay connected with the ship. This is the ship's bell. It's made out of silver and it was gifted by the people of Belfast for the ship of Belfast. But the secret remarkable thing about it is if you look inside, you can see it's inscribed with names. It goes from 2002 all the way back to 1949. Why? Well, if you've served on this ship, you can get your children or grandchildren christened on this ship. You take this, you turn it upside down, you fill it with holy water, and that is what the priest uses to bless them. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to listen to the History Hit Warfare podcast and subscribe to this channel for more tours like this one. vehicles already on the channel this year. Yeah, we've done tanks, we've done trucks, we've done ships, but there is one thing missing. That's right. Today, our challenge is to find some of the rarest, original and restored planes of World War II. And if you're looking for rare planes, where better to be than the Battle of Britain Air Show at IWM Duxford? But to find them, we're going to have to split up. May the best rare plane win. With over 200 planes here at Duxford, we weren't exactly stuck for choice. But no ordinary plane would do. We were seeking out aircraft that were rare, unique, or downright weird. Some of these planes, once a common sight in the skies, are now almost extinct. With the score in our challenge series level at two points each, this was a competition neither of us wanted to lose. To begin our search, we got up bright and early and headed straight to the Aircraft Restoration Company hangar, where director and pilot John Romain had promised to show us two of the rarest World War II planes on the planet. 
Okay, John, now this is a very unique looking aircraft. What is this? This is a Bristol Blenheim. A Bristol and, Blenheim. And uh, this is actually the, uh, the only flying example in the world. Wow. And it's actually a Blenheim Mark I uh, with this short nose. And it is the only Mark I Blenheim physically in the world now. At the time it came into the Royal Air Force, it was faster than any of their biplane fighters. Wow. So it, it came into the Royal Air Force as a very quick aeroplane for its day, uh, heavily used at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, and especially in the Battle of France, then into the Battle of Britain. And then it was used for convoy work. Um, they sent them out to the Far East, the Middle East, widely wow. used during the Second World War, up until it became redundant purely because the, the development of the German aircraft out exceeded this. And so the Blenheims were then taken out of service and things like Mosquitoes and bow fighters came in to replace it. It was a bomber, yeah, a light bomber, see. so it had bombs in the bomb well, yeah. or this aircraft was used as a night fighter. So it had a gun pack that went into the bomb bay. Um, this glass area here, yeah. you can still see the bomb uh, sight mount there. See so that there yeah. They could transform it from being a night fighter into a bomber within it's a hours. It's and, incredible. Uh, so its roles changed all the time. And it's got two engines, two twin engines. engines. Um, Bristol Mercury is a very rare engine these days. There's only actually six of these engines running in the world. Um, they are incredibly difficult to keep running and keep yeah. maintained. There's I no spares. Imagine. Um, it, they are very difficult to keep going. So you're looking at a, a very rare piece of machinery now. You had Two the pilot the and a navigator okay. in the front. And then if we walk around to the back, yep, you'll see the, back. the rear t or the mid turret. Very um, wide wing as well. Very wide wing. Um, of course, it was a, a good lift wing. So it, because of the bomb loads and everything, it, yep. you know, it, it had to be able to carry a bomb load. And here we have the turret. Um, yeah. With a little, the Mark One's just had this little Vickers K machine gun, um, which, according to to history, wasn't very successful at oh, all. I was going to say it doesn't look very big or powerful that no, machine gun there. It's not. <laughs> it's not. And so the guy in the back was the radio operator and the rear gunner. Got so it, he okay. had two roles two to do. Roles. It must have been incredibly difficult when you don't know where, you know, the, the pilot's going one way, you're trying to fire another. The angles must have, it must have been very difficult to defend this aircraft with such a small Yeah, it would have been incredibly difficult. Like and of course, the, the other thing is you have to be so careful that in your panic or rush to, fi to fire back at a fighter, you don't actually hit your own aircraft. Absolutely. And so that, that um, sort of plate there oh, yeah. that rides over stops the, the gunner from actually shooting off his own tail so, tail. <laughs> so, so wow. you've got that to consider as well so it, it was Incredible. unique in so many ways the Blenheim um, wow. but it was just you know it was overtaken by development very quickly and will you be flying this this weekend or will anyone be flying this yeah this is flying in the show um, we are putting it up with two Lysanders and a Gladiator so that and they all have the same engine so I mentioned earlier there's only six of those Bristol Mercury's actually flying in the world currently uh, we will have five, five of those ten. engines flying together ah, so be, uh, the uh, the ubiquitous sound yeah it's a, and incredible. they they sound lovely and as luck would have it, we could hear the sound of those magnificent Bristol Mercury engines as a Lysander pulled in after a test flight. I think Luke's just seen the Blenheim, which is a very rare one, isn't it? Yes, it is. But we've yeah. got one here that is as rare, certainly as impressive. Yes, it's a, uh, a Western Lysander. Um, not as rare as the Blenheim. There are three of these flying in the world, so three. it's, not it's too pretty bad. close. This is our particular aircraft, um, a British built one. Some of them are Canadian built. Uh, this is a, an actual British aeroplane with British history as well. So it was built in the early 1940s, used right through the Second World War, ended up in Canada on a training squadron. But before it went to Canada, it was used uh, in the UK. A lot of them were used uh, eventually for dropping spies into France. And so they would then have a, a ladder fitted on the side. Um, they'd take the winglets and the bombs off. It's got the ability to land in very short spaces. So you, it, 
um, although it'll cruise quite quickly at 170 miles an hour to 190 miles an hour, it will land at about 45 to 50 miles an hour in very short areas. So they used to fly them into fields in France and drop spies off. And then the return flight, they would hopefully bring back downed airmen that had been found by the resistance. And then they were wow. flown back to the UK in Lysanders. That's a very interesting role. I mean, maybe not capturing the same glory as the Spitfire, but a very important role in World War II. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's yeah. got the, the winglets um, and it carries um, small bombs on there. It's also got machine guns in the wheel spats. So there's 303 machine guns in here. And then they would have a two, um, two Browning machine guns in the back. So the, the rear hatch would slide open and they would pop up two machine guns there. There were two crew, there was a pilot and a rear gunner, and he obviously operated those rear guns. So it, was, it carried a fair amount of armament in, in its time. Um, but of course, when they were doing the spy work, they took all of that away because all they wanted to do was to get people inside it rather than have any guns at all. A good start for both of us, two special aircraft that we'd get to see flying later on in the day. But I was in a hurry and I'd heard about a very rare aircraft being worked on nearby. Now, here in the fighter collection at IWM Duxford, you've got all sorts of planes that are under restoration being restored to airworthiness. So, we've got the P-51 Mustang here. You've got the Spitfire, the Supermarine Spitfire over here. But the one I'm most excited about isn't even finished. It's this one here. It's an Italian aircraft. It's the Fiat Falco. And when this one is airworthy, it'll be the only example that can fly in the world. Now, the Italians during the Second World War weren't known for being particularly effective, I think that's fair to say. But this plane, the Fiat Falco biplane, was praised by the RAF for its exceptional manoeuvrability and speed. And it did serve in almost every theatre of war. It was involved in the Battle of Britain, the Battle of France, Malta, and was particularly effective on the Eastern Front. But what really did for the Falco was the more effective monoplanes, the Spitfires, the Hurricanes and by the time the Italians surrendered in 1943, there were only a handful of these that were still in flying condition. Now, there's clearly some work to do before this particular plane is airworthy. The wings aren't on for a start. But we do know a little bit about the history of this plane. We know that it went down during a test flight in the north of Sweden in 1942. The pilot was killed during that incident and the plane wasn't recovered until 1983. But it's nice to think that 80 years after that crash, this Fiat Falco could soon be airworthy again. Two rare planes in the bag. Meanwhile, Luke had predictably headed straight for the largest hangar on site and was weighing up his options. I'd need to catch up. Now, when you think of British World War II bombers, you might think of the Stirling or indeed the Lancaster. You probably don't think of this plane up here. This is the de Havilland Mosquito, also known as the Wooden Wonder. When Geoffrey de Havilland first sent his design to the British government, after Air Ministry calls for a faster, medium-sized bomber, they simply weren't interested. A bomber made out of wood was initially deemed unfit for action. In spite of this, with his own factory and workforce, de Havilland continued production of the Mosquito, and after overwhelmingly positive performance tests, it didn't take long for the project to receive financial backing and the Mosquito to become a crucial bomber of the Royal Air Force. The fact that the de Havilland Mosquito was made out of wood meant three things. First of all, it could be produced at a much quicker rate than any other bomber. Second of all, it was more buoyant, should it have to ditch into water. And third of all, it could reach speeds of up to 415 miles per hour. In fact, when it was tested against Spitfires, it was actually the Spitfires that were struggling to keep up with this plane. Helping the Mosquito achieve these speeds uh, are these two twin 
Merlin V12 27 litre Rolls-Royce engines uh, and with them you have these absolutely gigantic propellers. Now if you actually follow the trajectory you can see they virtually touch the cockpit. When it was finally put into service, this plane actually had the lowest loss rate of any aircraft in Bomber Command. Now that was because of a combination of its speed, uh, its maneuverability, and the fact it was very difficult for radar to detect it. Later on in the war, weapons were added. Four 303 caliber Browning machine guns and the same number of cannons fitted underneath its chin. Amazingly, the weapons only slowed the already rapid aircraft by 15 knots. Now, one measure of the success uh, of this aircraft is the way in which Luftwaffe commanders used to speak about it. None other than Hermann Goering, the head of the German Air Force, said this. I am furious when I see the mosquito. I turn green and yellow with envy. Now I'm really excited to have found one of my favourite planes here. This is the Fairy Swordfish. It's not the most glamorous plane we've included and in many ways it looks like a relic of the First World War and it certainly had its problems in terms of performance. It was so slow that some crew described the feeling of being in it as being like going downhill and yet as a torpedo bomber it was extremely effective, certainly the most effective of the British fleet air arm. Shortly after we filmed this, the very lucky Dan Snow got the chance to fly in one of the few airworthy swordfish, and you'll be able to see that video on the channel soon. So what made the swordfish so effective? Well, it could take off from British carriers in the most atrocious weather conditions. It was slow, but that actually made it really difficult to hit, and it ended up as a torpedo bomber, sinking more tonnage of Axis shipping than any other aircraft. We know a little bit about the history of this swordfish. We know, for example, that it was painted black for nighttime operations. But lots of swordfish were used to defend Allied convoys against German U-boats. And among its many accolades, the swordfish was actually the first aircraft in the British fleet air arm to sink a U-boat. The swordfish was involved in various notable battles of the Second World War. It carried out a really successful raid on the Italian fleet at Taranto, proving itself once again. But perhaps the moment of glory for the swordfish came in May 1941, when 15 of them took off from HMS Ark Royal to attack the German battleship Bismarck. Now, each of these swordfish carried only one of these torpedoes. They had one chance to hit their mark, and two of them did so and were able to sink the German battleship. Two unsung heroes of the Second World War, each playing decisive roles in key battles during the conflict. To have a chance of winning, I'd have to think outside the box, and I'd already spotted something pretty wacky inside the Battle of Britain hangar. When I saw this aircraft earlier, I had to stop by again. This is the C-30A Autogyro. It's a Spanish design, but it was licensed to be produced in the UK and only 146 were made. So it's very rare indeed. Now let's talk about what makes this aircraft so weird and unique. It obviously doesn't have any wings. It's driven forward by the uh, propeller and the engine at the front, but then it has these great big rotor blades which provide the lift and ensure the stability of the aircraft. Invented by the Spanish engineer Juan de la Sierva, who wanted to create an aircraft that could fly safely at slow speeds, the autogyro was first flown in 1923 in Madrid. After his initial success, Sierra accepted an offer to establish his own autogyro company in England, and by 1925, Britain had become the world centre of autogyro development. Once the war broke out, 
the RAF quickly found a role for the aircraft that would prove vital in defending Britain's shores. Now a more important question is what was this aircraft used for? Well in the early 1940s radar was an entirely new innovation and this aircraft helped to calibrate it. What it would do is it would fly very slowly so it was able to get into an exact position so that radar could obtain an accurate signal. Admittedly that is one weird flying machine. But if Luke believed small and unusual would win this competition, I was going for the complete opposite. For my final choice, I'd gone for a plane that was truly gigantic. Right, we've already seen lots of planes that were around at the start of the Second World War. This one was responsible for ending it dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 and really changing the world in the process. It's not the rarest plane here, but it is an absolute beast. It is, of course, the American B-29 Superfortress. It was 30 metres long, the wingspan was 40 metres. It was 61 tonnes when loaded with bombs and it could fly over 3,000 miles which made it perfect for hitting targets across the Pacific in Japanese occupied territory. One really interesting thing about the Super Fortress is these gun turrets are remotely operated. So the gunners wouldn't be sat here in a glass bubble exposed to enemy fighters. They'd be up in the fuselage at a sighting station and these are controlled by computers. So it just shows how technology has moved on since the start of the Second World War. And if remotely operated gun turrets aren't space age enough for you, then the nose of the Super Fortress was the inspiration behind the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars. Our choices were locked in and typically, Louis had managed to squeeze in an extra entry. But before we had discussed who'd actually won, we had a show to watch. Among the dozens of recognisable and rare planes preparing for takeoff were the Bristol Blenheim and two Lysanders. But for any fans of World War II aircraft, this was going to be quite a spectacle. Well, it's been a wet and rainy end to the Battle of Britain Air Show at IWM Duxford, hasn't it? But we've loved this weekend. I mean, we've seen so many fantastic, rare World War II planes. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen some of the last of their kind to fly in the skies. And we've seen some pretty weird aircraft as well. I mean, the, the auto gyro springs to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really weird. What were your standouts? Well, I have to say, one of my favourites is the Swordfish. It's just one of those planes that, like, punches above its weight, you know, was involved in such a huge moment in World War II, the sinking of Bismarck, even though it looks completely antiquated, involved in other battles. The Lysander as well, fantastic history, picking up allied airmen in France, picking up members of the French resistance, and we got to see that one fly, so that was pretty good. What, what was your favourite? <sighs> That's true, I mean, we got to see the Blenheim fly as well, that was a remarkable aircraft, John Romain, an absolute legend yeah. as well. 
I've got a soft spot for the mosquito, similarly to the, to the swordfish. It's a very underrated aircraft of the Second World War, but I think I'd be an idiot not to choose the auto, auto gyro. I think that's such a weird looking plane. It's like a helicopter and a plane combined. It's, it's a weird sort of hybrid. They're only 140 or so made. For me, that's got to be the winner. But it didn't fly. I mean, the point of this air show is that we get to see, see the planes fly, right? I mean, I didn't even mention the Fiat Falco, which is the Italian fighter plane, because it's in bits, you know? It's, it's a very fascinating plane, but I have to go for the Lysander because we got to see it actually fly. So you're going for the Lysander, I'm going for the Auto Gyro. It's plainly obvious <laughs> that we're not going to agree. <laughs> I don't think we're going to agree. How are we going to solve it? I think you are going to have to tell us what you think your favourite is. Okay, guys, you heard him. Let us know down in the comments what plane do you think should be the winner of this challenge. Yeah, and if you like this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel. We'll be back with more like this very yep. soon. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers guys, see you soon.